There we go. Good. Here we go. Give it a second. Yeah. Good. Good. My laptop's not very loud either, though. Hello, hello, hello. Do you want me to go onto my laptop? I'm gonna go onto my laptop over here. Oh, and watch and it. And watch it. Tell, I'll tell you. Hold on. Can you? Oh. Um, <laughs> can you hear it? We. I'm hearing us. Okay. Can you? Huh? Yeah. You can search that. Or just. I'm sure if you search Kent State Cha Cha, it'll come up. No, it's the computer. Yeah. Uh, what are you doing? Streaming. Through where? YouTube. Uh oh. Uh oh. So, cancel. Cancel. Who's going to be out there listening? Yeah. Anyone. <laughs> okay, so now what do I need to get this thing to recognize it? Um, it's just nothing. I don't think it's just nothing. Do you see any? Uh, I see nothing. I see something on my screen, but. Uh, we won't see. I can turn it up or take it out. What's what's the volume? Of I turned it down a little because turn it all the way out. because it was reverb. Yeah. Take your phone out of the case. I can turn it up or take it out. What's the volume? I turned it down a little because it was reverb. Yeah. That's that's my turn it up. Try and okay. I'll be right back. I'm gonna go leave it like that. Yeah. That's what you hear yeah. that though? Is that on there? I'm sorry, I'm gonna go check. Oh yeah. Okay. I want to stand it up a little. Yeah, good thing. You go for it. I want to tinker. Oh, it's working up. Yeah, for mine. Plug it for mine. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't Wait a minute. It's gonna have to catch up. It's probably. <laughs> and then we can dress, um, address all the color issues too if you want to mess that way. Because it's kind of, I feel like, I guess it depends if we turn the lights off or not. 
Right now, I feel like it's really washed out. It's like ever so slight. I'm like waiting for it to catch up there. Do you have that oh. that makes one lose 50 pounds? <laughs> <laughs> you look slim, you look slim. Do your job. <laughs> <laughs> no sign, no profile. <laughs> I'll like, okay. There we go, I think that's it right there. Ooh, that's the ticket right there. Is that in? Alright, cool. Leave that how it is. I'm gonna go grab that.
some banana pudding and peanut butter jelly sandwich to your next stop.
some banana pudding and peanut butter jelly sandwich to your next stop. to bring some banana pudding and peanut butter jelly sandwich to your next stop. to bring some banana pudding and peanut butter jelly sandwich to your next stop. to bring some banana pudding and peanut butter jelly sandwich to your next stop.
some banana pudding and peanut butter jelly sandwich to your next stop. And uh, it uh, came out of the deliberation of the uh, research and information committee that uh, realized that uh, the students do not know what the faculty is doing. You know, they're doing things and they come out and talk a little bit in classes and then they go inside again. And so it gives you an idea of what these people are doing in their offices. And it will also show you another dimension of your academic experience in Kent that you probably would never know unless we go out and, and tell you about it, which is the research aspect. There is a lot in learning, but learning does not only happen in classrooms or uh, uh, lecture halls or things like this. They happen in labs, they happen in libraries, it happens everywhere. So I want you to take advantage of what we are going to talk about today, just to give an idea. If you have parallel interest, if you see something that you like and you want to talk to us, and remember, nine out of how many, 26 people, or full-time and uh, a large number of part-time faculty, they all have experiences and research that happens outside. So, welcome again, and thank you for coming, and I hope you will have a wonderful uh, experience with us. Uh, today, our moderator will be Ms. Bridget, and uh, she will be our uh, timekeeper, and she will make sure that we are online and behaving. Thank you very much, and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. So, welcome everyone to our CAD uh, research night. Um, as Adele mentioned, my name is Bridget Callahan, and tonight nine members of our faculty will be presenting their creative ideas and some of their own research. Uh, for those of you who have never been to a Pecha Picha lecture before, it's a pretty interesting format. Um, it's a little bit challenging because many of the presentations you'll see tonight will be a condens condensation of months or years of their own research summed up into six minutes and 40 seconds. Each of the presenters will be showing us 20 images, and they will be able to speak for 20 seconds per image show. So I will be um, monitoring the time, and I will give notice to each of our presenters when we have reached the five minute um, portion of, the, of their presentation. And uh, if any of them choose to go over a little bit, I'll just walk up to the stage and they will know. <laughs> uh, so without further ado, I would like to present our associate, Dean Willoughby. He will be presenting a talk titled, Firms That Conduct Research, The What and the Why. So please join me in welcoming Dean Willoughby. So, firms that conduct research, the what and the why. 
really excited to be talking about this. This is something that I've presented at the AIA. Um, I want to make you all aware that uh, there are there are multiple firms in the United States that recognize the value of research. Um, and I think it's an important skill for you as students and for us as faculty to embrace and engage in. So it's something that is really key. The general definition of research by Bruce Archer was a, a civil engineer who thought about research and design is systemic inquiry whose goal is communicable knowledge. Theory doesn't necessarily work that way. Theory creates frameworks, but theory does not ultimately establish research. Research has a very specific focus, um, and it differs because um, theory is really about establishing a broader perspective. Research, though, is more focused. Research is rigorous, and it's an investigation undertaken in order to gain original and significant knowledge. Um, not, a, not everything creative is research. This is something I want to make very clear. Uh, designing buildings is not always research. Um, however, rigorously experimenting in ways to improve design and construction, that's research. That serves as a research. So activities and processes that sort of establish uh, newfound possibilities work in that way. Um, an example of a architect who is a, who is a celebrated designer and a researcher is the 2016 Pritzker Prize uh, winner um, that you just saw there. There are five characteristics of research. One is that it's systematic and planned. The next is that it's inquiry driven, meaning seeking answers to questions. It needs to be goal oriented, knowledge directed, and communicable. It has to be shared with others. These are the fundamental aspects that are, I think, important to research in general. So, so I'm planning on telling you more about research in, 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 in practice here. And I gotta say, it's such a sad thing to show this meme because of Gene Wilder's death, but I wanted to share it with you. So uh, design practices are becoming much more complex. They're being driven by, tech, by technology. They're being shaped by new regulations. And research skills will be of greater importance to practices in the, the future. Firms that don't practice will fall behind. And to quote Friedrich Nietzsche, those who sleep will soon drop off. And I think that that's an important statement for us to all know because we have to be vigilant about the importance of research. So you can see what can happen if you don't do research. Um, I love a smiling, burning girl. To mean those, but um, but I want to talk about firms that are are doing research at a sophisticated level. HKS in Dallas, and they have they have offices all all over. Has a established a strong set of researchers, uh, research practices that help their practice along. Cadre is one of the examples of this. Um, Upali Nanda is the director of CADRI. CADRI stands for Center for Advanced Design Research and Evaluation. They hire people who do specific research. They want to evaluate this. They see themselves as a nonprofit. HKS just doesn't have this aspect, but they also have HKS Line, which stands for Laboratory for Intensive Exploration. This is a design specific group that looks at new and emerging technologies and how they apply to create really outstanding and exceptionally uh, sophisticated buildings. Perkins and Will has a group called AREA uh, that stands for Advancing research, expanding, and applying. And this is something that sort of builds their practice in such a way that you're not just delivering a building, but you're also building off a body of knowledge, and a body of, of knowledge that is very specific and, and uh, communicable. They have some, um, uh, uh, Perkins has some very uh, specific uh, goals for the organization area, one that I think is really amazing is, is a connection to ARCC. In 2015, many of our faculty went to a, 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 um, a uh, conference that was conducted with uh, Perkins and Will area as well as with um, uh, 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 the ARCC. Uh, Kieran Timberlake is, is a mid-sized firm in uh, Philadelphia that has in their very name architecture, planning, and research. 
They're very uh, specific on this, and they are very much engaged in doing research. They uh, 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 develop software, but they also develop um, uh, uh, new forms of technology, new uh, materials. And I've got to say that there are opportunities for, for this. So here's the question. While you're in school, either as an undergraduate or a graduate, why are you doing research? It's something that will be a key aspect to your success in the future. Research can also be supported. This is the AIA has a has a has has opportunities to support research called the Upton Initiative. We have had faculty at Kent State who have received grant foundation grants. The Van Allen Inn Institute in New York uh, supported one of our faculty at one point in time to do uh, research. But these are not just for academics. These are also available for practitioners. Practitioners involve the Young Architects Pro, Pro, Pro Program at PS1 is a form of research. Research alone is not good enough. You also have to share it with others, like a oh, good guy here, you know, he's, good, he's wanting to share there. Uh, um, so one of the things is, is attend a research event. Do some research and share it with other people. It's an important thing. Um, you advance the, prof the, the profession with, our, with our, our research. If you share it, you get accolades from your peers. Um, so one possibility is to contribute to an open access journal. It's something to think about. Uh, and this is uh, available to not just our faculty, but to you all as students, or in combination as well. So one last thing, brace yourself for the future of research. It's coming. Uh, AIA is starting something called a practice relevant research roadmap. They understand the importance of research in practice. They want to increase the literacy of it in the profession. They want to support research and they want to celebrate it as well. So they want to be your go to source for research. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the durability 
but possibly if you go upstairs and look at on the floor, possibly you can see all the cracking on, uh, on the floor plans that's caused by the shrinkage. My current started to look at bamboo, and uh, the bamboo is renewable, barely renewable. High strength, it's large. We can do a lot with bamboo material. I collaborated with one professor in China. We developed really innovative the structural systems and basically they're trying to recycle, reuse all the bamboo in the building construction. And we have and basically the uh, slab, the beam, the collar, developed all the connections. Uh, we have already run some of the research uh, back in China on the process trying to evaluate and measure the sustainability of the project. Another material is on my radar stretch material. By 2020, in the state of Ohio, all the stretch material cannot be dumped back into the lake Erie. So we might have to think about how to recycle, reuse all the materials. Then we can use the dredge in the shred mix. And possibly I did brought some the shred mix cut. Then we can make some the art, really amazing, the art object with stretch material. This here's one project I did with one professor in college art. Funded by the Ohio, <coughs> the Lake Area Commission, I did one project and I get all the samples from one CDF uh, and make a light with aggregate. It is really amazing to look at how much weight that we can reduce in <coughs> the light weight in the aggregate. We recycle, reduce, incorporate from the material <coughs> in, uh, in the grains and possibly in the tree in the back and possibly you know, after uh, the presentation. You can look at we proved the plants can grow in the grains material with, with all the light weight aggregate we produce in the lab. The most important is current, I'm working with the Professor Brian Peters. The current study, and we would like you to look at the potential to use dredge as 3D, 3D printing material. And here's all the walls, all the shell structures. You can do the foam standing and a 3D print all the blocks and build all the shell structures. I do research in the field of infrastructure. To look at how to manage, for example, the steel shell structures. And a couple of years ago, I did one project for the Army Council Engineer. Uh, we proposed a really amazing kind of uh, method to manage their infrastructure. I did a project with the city of Denver to manage all the, all the bridge structures. Most important to look at the method technologies to uh, measure the natural frequency of the cable state structures. This technique can be used for the building people's data to structures. I work with uh, uh, Professor Rick Kaufman on one project to look at uh, the green infrastructure, define and measure what's happening in the community. It's really cool the project we did two students involved in this project. Uh, in addition, uh, actually, large scale for the community, community skills. I worked with one professor from the geology. We looked at the really amazing we developed a tool to manage all the streets, all the roads for the state of Ohio. Uh, we are putting together papers out, and hopefully we can get it finished pretty quick. Uh, you know, teaching the research, I do the practice as well, and I do the divide. And here's one structure I defined a couple of years ago, designed for trust structures, and basically it's how to replace all the bedroom for the bridge, and this project costs five hundred fifty thousand dollars. So finally, I would like to acknowledge my uh, the college support from the college from the university, and most important, I would like to acknowledge my uh, the funding agencies support all my research project. So I'm I'm here, I'm recruiting. <laughs> and if you have any research interests, and uh, let me know. Let you know, uh, Professor Kaufman, uh, Professor Brian Peters know about it and how we can work together on something truly amazing. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Ray. That was an excellent example of how he has done so much work and condensed it into, that was even less than six minutes and 40 seconds. I don't know how you did that. Um, next, I would like to introduce Professor Regard, who will be presenting Severe Modern 
popular modernisms in the network space of exposition. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage. didn't exist yet. <laughs> and um, it's a very strange phrase. Severe is a term that is used to describe uh, a period in the evolution of classical art. Uh, it's also an aesthetic term that is used to describe something that is usually sort of manly and not too heavily ornamental. Uh, why it would be used in this context is not very clear. Uh, and I was kind of interested in that. Uh, they succeeded in their goal. Uh, the master plan for this exposition was released a few weeks later in January, and the whole thing was built in time for its opening in, at the end of June. Uh, it's a really remarkable story. Um, obviously, what they designed and built was temporary, and that seems to have something to do with their stylistic choices. Uh, these are not architects who necessarily design modern architecture. They were Cleveland architects who designed rich people's houses in the suburbs. But in this context, they felt they needed to design modern architecture. So what is that context? Well, I talk about the exposition as a context in relation to this idea, uh, which comes ultimately from the philosopher Foucault, Foucault, but has been codified by another philosopher, Giorgio Agamben. Um, and it seems to be a very vague concept, but it's actually more precise than it seems. An exposition is a heterogeneous set. It includes everything you can think of from strippers to displays of mineralogy. Um, but it has a concrete strategic function, and it is related to power. It is the elites of society who convene these. Um, and it is about knowledge. It is in some way about progress and about the future. Um, however, it is not stable. These things are put together very quickly. They involve hundreds, if not thousands, of people all working at cross purposes and sometimes together. Uh, and for that reason, I turn in my work to actor network theory, uh, which involves another philosopher, Bruno Latour. Um, and this is not his words, these are my words. Uh, and the idea here is that the work put into making the exposition is not a reflection of culture or society or the, the views of the state. It is part of the work that's required to define those things. And therefore, there is a dynamic set of relationships in play. That goes against the typical way in which uh, architecture has been dealt with in scholarship on expositions. The tendency of the historians who've written on it is to assume that architecture is a kind of megaphone that amplifies exactly the message that the powerful people who convened the exposition want to get across. Um, 
Just think of the way the Chicago Columbian Exposition is talked about. My argument is that, uh, in fact, the material choices of designers and exhibitors are part of the work of redefining that message in each case. That, unfortunately, means I need to talk about style. And I've crossed out the word style here because it's a word we hate to talk about. Architects hate it. Architectural historians hate it. But we all use it, uh, which is a really funny problem. Um, we don't like it. We have no good definition of it. Uh, we don't know how to talk about it very well, and we're a little ashamed of it. Um, and that has been something that has bedeviled my work on expositions for the last few years. The Cleveland Exposition, for example, had a very clear strategic purpose. Um, this is a map produced by the exposition people. I love this map. It's the United States with the states proportioned by their industrial output in the 1930s. <laughs> And uh, you can see um, it's a very different picture of the economy than you would have today. Uh, and uh, their goal was to show that Cleveland was the epicenter of America's industrial future, uh, very clearly. The architects were not sure what that looked like. These are various drafts of what became this building. Is that severe and modern? I do not know. Uh, it clearly involved a lot of on-the-fly decisions with lighting engineers, with construction engineers, uh, and with exhibitors. Um, and in that sense, it reflected the much more, more richly documented process that produced the Century of Progress exposition in Chicago a few years earlier. These are some of Joseph Urban's drawings for buildings in that. Um, and it is an unusual architecture. It is not international style modernism. It is not Art Deco. It is not any of the isms of that moment. It's something else that was produced for this particular purpose. But it does have a visual family resemblance that you would have to call a style. And it was very troubling to people at the time. This is from an article that was published during the Cleveland Exposition. It was written by somebody who was either Lewis Mumford or knew Lewis Mumford well enough to write just like him. Um, the article is anonymous, it's not signed. Uh, and um, that itself is a rather puzzling fact. Uh, and uh, his argument is the architecture is modern, in quotation marks, he hates it. Um, Everything is unsatisfying, and ultimately, nobody is learning anything. I mean, done? <laughs> okay, I knew that was going to happen. Um, so what I'm trying to look at is how architects in the 1930s were designing for expositions and how they were negotiating with definitions of modern architecture. And I'll end with this because this really is the puzzle. These were all buildings designed by one firm for the 1939 New York World's Fair. That firm is Skidmore Owings Merrill. <laughs> um, okay, I'll stop there. All right. <laughs> Diagrams that 
I didn't really understand. But in the end, I, I chose to do it, and I'm glad I did, because it seems like this idea of transition management, of helping things change, is a really useful lens for looking at almost all the work we do uh, at the CABC. Because we, we work in 12 counties, and um, whenever we arrive in a place, you know, there's always sort of the city that was, but is no longer, and then the city that could be, but it isn't yet. And in that space between the, between the no longer and the not yet, you can do a lot of really useful work. Um, so for instance, this is in Cleveland, this is Opportunity Corridor. Uh, it's a $330 million roadway that's going to connect the airport to University Circle. Everything in the map that you see in yellow, blue, and green is either a vacant lot or a vacant building. So it's a brand new road that's going to blast through really the most distressed part of the city. And it's not about an incremental change. I mean, this road's going to change everything, but nobody's imagined what that future development would look like. So we did. Um, this isn't the vision for Opportunity Corridor. It's a vision, an idea that begins to look at how you could put pieces together to leverage the investment in this giant road. Um, our work didn't really get much traction, so we brought in the students. It's our secret weapon. Um, this was the studio from the summer of 2015. Um, Mickey Hrostowski was proposing here some precision drone-based agriculture, which I have to admit I was skeptical of at first, but that beautiful side plant sort of won me over. Um, Opportunity Corridor isn't the only place in Cleveland or even in the region that's going to be experiencing large transitions. This map shows, particularly in this area here in Cleveland, um, there's so much vacancy and so much disinvestment that it isn't about making subtle shifts. It's about reinvention. One of the projects we have funding for from the National Endowment for the Arts looks at ways of revealing waterways that were culverted decades ago um, to accommodate development. Now that we have so much vacancy, can we use the, um, the vacant land that we have to begin restoring natural patterns of hydrology through temporary intervention? Um, we're also working on longer term strategies. This is work funded by the Kresge Foundation over the next three years um, that looks at improving neighborhood scale climate resilience, particularly in the ways that green infrastructure and the neighborhood scale and strategic reforestation can help buffer residents from the adverse impacts of climate change. But it's not just vacant land. I mean, we are a school of architecture at the end of the day, and Cleveland has um, 6,135 vacant buildings in distressed condition, probably most of which will be demolished um, at a cost of over $65 million. And so we were curious about whether some of them could be saved, and we're especially attached to this one. It took two and a half years and the work of a lot of third-year undergraduate students, but um, we had a design-build studio that looked at low-cost, high-impact um, reuse of, um, of a vacant house. The house is done. It's for sale. And now we only have 6,134 more to go. <laughs> 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 um, this is from this summer studio. Um, Kayla Scoville is here, did some work at the neighborhood scale about the ways that we can redevelop residential neighborhoods to protect um, children from the really devastating effects of lead toxicity. And this is um, Sam Ayotte's work that looked also um, at the same watershed that we're working on, the Giddings Brook and revealing it um, in the neighborhood. Um, this is the uh, Detroit Superior Bridge. Um, another thread of our work deals with surplus infrastructure and the ways that you manage infrastructure in a city with a declining population. Um, the upper level roadway is one of the busiest streets in Cleveland. The lower level it, is vacant. It was designed for streetcars, but there haven't been streetcars in 60 years. So is there a way that we can kind of unleash the latent value of surplus infrastructure? This is a project we've been working on since 2008 or 2009 um, that looks at this kind of really amazing work of architecture Five that's minutes. invisible. Okay. Um, the first thing we did was we um, brought students there who had four weeks to uh, envision and fabricate some modifications to the bridge that would make the space functional for the public. Um, we threw open the doors to the bridge and 8,000 people showed up. And you may not think that that's research, but the students watched what these people did and were able to collect a lot of qualitative data about how the bridge could be used um, in the future when we're ready to make permanent improvements. We've since brought people to the bridge over the years many times. Thousands of people have been on the bridge. Um, and we hope um, that this work will eventually lead to more informed design decisions for permanent improvements. 
And then in the spring, we took students to Havana, which may seem a little bit random. But when you think about transitions, I mean, there really is no city um, about to experience kind of this level of transition. People talk about wanting to go to Havana before it changes, but it's already changed and it's continuing to change. And so bringing in our students to think about what a preferred future could look like, and then working backward to figure out how we can make investments today that will help get to that place in the future. I mean, this is kind of what urban design is about. It's about um, kind of developing a longer term strategy and then you know, kind of really carefully considering the steps to get there. So there are a lot of things going on at the CUDC, at least in my head, they're all connected. And I hope by coming here tonight, you all can begin uh, to think about the ways maybe that the things you're interested in could connect to us, because at the CDC, we really want to be part of the life of the college. Um, and we can certainly find a way for your interest to kind of match with ours. I'm done. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Schwartz. Um, next, we have Professor Lusak, who will be presenting Leveraging Computers. Please join me and welcome him to the stage. So a lot of my interests in, in my research sort of focuses around what computers can inform us, how it can solve problems, how it, if we can discover new um, possibilities. And a lot of these skill sets or the tool sets that I tend to rely on uh, include the languages of C, Python, and oh, that's a lot. Uh, Python, uh, Grasshopper, and um, uh, what's on the other side. But here's some examples of what I've done early on for sort of like generative forms, which means trying to do stuff that uh, is labor intensive, uh, uh, paired with some of the software that's out here. So I created a script to create the structure, and then I paired it with uh, T-splines to sort of look at these uh, various uh, forms here. Um, that same script. Then, oops, oops. Uh, then gave us uh, an opportunity to look at, you know, it's the same script, but it can't, comes up differently when you sort of like uh, introduce a little analog work to it. A uh, script uh, next to it is, is just um, uh, a little random uh, movement. Um, here's, here's where uh, I'm looking at, uh, we scripted something called cellular automata, and it's, it's, it has a whole set of weather uh, points sort of like uh, live or die based upon their neighborhoods. And we, when we ran the script and then uh, looked at various ways of uh, uh, using that to uh, in an architectural form, and not only did it, it create sort of the, the cubic nature of it, but we also used it to define sort of the, uh, uh, the surface that sort of flows through it. Uh, one of, uh, another one of my interests is uh, particle and swarm behaviors, and basically it's uh, sets of rules that are based upon attraction, orientation, and separation. Uh, it, each time it uh, will go through um, the, um, the, the loop and, and determine where each point exists, and within a range it will uh, change the, the uh, point's direction and, and orientation based upon what's around it. Uh, we then take and use that to sort of trace the paths, and from the paths we can actually start to look at various form definitions. Okay, and some things we don't expect, and, and others we can sort of predict. But this is sort of like unusual uh, what it sort of generated on its own uh, when we sort of applied sort of this uh, ISO surfaces on top of the uh, the path structure. Um, one of the other things that I've been investigating is uh, uh, 
physical computing and that uh, is sort of taking the Arduino uh, controllers and learning how to program them. I'm really not just interested in borrowing scripts, I'm interested in going back to the, uh, the heart of, the, um, of how, to, how to build your scripts from scratch and how to take and uh, apply those to um, uh, how to control, oh, there, go. there we go, control LEDs and sensors, actuators to sort of make more responsive buildings. We can use it to uh, data log uh, and uh, create Internet of Things, uh, creating smarter uh, cities and uh, high performance buildings. We actually exist in high performance buildings that we are, are surrounded by um, various sensors that are changing uh, the performance of this building on a regular basis. Uh, paired this with simulations and we get um, to, to start to uh, determine how best to structure the buildings uh, based upon the lighting and the thermal conditions or the, uh, uh, the various um, uh, environmental conditions around it. Another uh, interesting uh, thing that I sort of looked at is uh, um, egress simulations and basically trying to figure out uh, where pinch points occur and, and how to uh, safely take and model uh, the rest of the building. Good evening, I'm happy to 
pleased to speak with you about novel ecologies and to talk about opportunities that are associated with the novel ecology design lab, which is uh, hopefully you'll find um, some, some volunteer or paid opportunities with the group here on campus. You're obviously very uh, used to these. These are our natural ecologies or our natural ecosystems, but they essentially have been uh, altered heavily and restructured as a part of human settlement on the globe to the point that they will not necessarily uh, return to what their earlier functions were, changing the services that we need as humans um, to continue to, to, uh, to move forward. This is um, challenging cities to essentially look at not replacing or preserving those, those natural ecologies, but to come up with new forms of ecosystems that can exist within the urban fabric. Our future cities will be an integration of these new or novel types of ecosystems with our past understandings and future understandings of cities. We are fortunate to be able to see these both in artistic exhibits and architectural examples from the conceptual stage like this from the south of Jamoto, but also we currently are building first phase type of engagements with novel ecologies like this project in Milan by Stefano Mori the Bosco Berkali, which won uh, the International Tall Building Competition last year. In addition to that, not only are these uh, projects looking at just individual locations, but they've begun to expand over the entire city environment. This is the Sejong City, South Korea, which is not just a design and, and digital fabrication and conceptual orientation, but the city of, of almost a half a million people is already under phase one development with buildings that are uh, as you see here, kind of laden with ecology, uh, replete with green roofs and walls and new forms and ways of seeing the ecosystem. Now, what we're doing here in Kent and what we're doing here in Northeast Ohio in Ned Lab uh, is trying to look at the ways in which we can, one, develop some of the conceptual realms and theoretical realms for novel ecologies, but largely we're working on real solid problems and trying to bring functional pieces together. Um, the NED Lab is a group of, of individuals uh, mixed of, made up of faculty as well as students from, um, the, from Kent State University. And this is our website. You can find us at nedlab.org. And you can research a little bit about who we are and I'm gonna talk a little bit about study opportunities uh, for you. There's a few projects that we're exploring but that we're working on. Um, couple that I can show you tonight, but mainly we're looking at certain kinds of questions. One of the questions we've been looking at is can novel ecologies move? Can these ecosystems move around and be a part of the space and time component that's more common with human settlement? Um, we have this project underway, which was funded early by the US EPA and currently funded by the Department of Biology. The young woman in green is a woman uh, pursuing her PhD, looking at the soils and plants. But we're actually looking for a volunteer to take on our second phase as a fabricator or um, essentially a, a, uh, an innovator who will help us move the, the product itself, which is a movable type of ecosystem, into the patent process. We're, we're already in the patent pending, but we'd like to go for a full patent. If that's something of interest to you, please check out our website or, or catch up with one of us after this. Another thing that we're doing is, is looking at whether or not rare plants can find new homes in these novel ecosystems. It's a kind of an easy thing, not easy, but it's a pretty easy thing to put in native plants. But what about the ones that are almost gone? Um, we've been able to, to sh uh, make a home for this, this rare, actually it's an endangered violet, called a prairie violet, in green roofs around uh, uh, Ohio. We now have a couple growing you see in the picture on your right, I've uh, grown in a, a roof in uh, Gordon Square in Cleveland. But we're also trying to find it some friends and we have some pl uh, test plots that are growing over in the Collinwood neighborhood in these kind of little trays. One of our biggest projects is the River Dredge Project, which Dr. Uh, Yu talked about uh, earlier in this evening, and whether or not river dredge can really be used to clean stormwater, to turn something that is polluting water right now into something that actually can clean it. We, we will be um, employing a lot of volunteers. Uh, we do have some paid positions for this. 
in conceptualization, areas of conceptualizing new forms of this um, using dredge. Construction, we will be doing some small plot constructions in the summer. And doing uh, evaluations, as kind of shown by the female there, uh, student uh, a few years ago. We do have a, we do have a friend with it, a, a rare, rare friend is actually back here, growing in the dredge. This is our violet, one of the, one of the trays we brought with us. So please check, uh, please check her out. And um, <laughs> you can touch her, it's okay. You can, you can also pick up the dredge and kind of get an idea of what that center dredge material is like. Um, please follow up via our email or check on the video or Dr. Dr. Elu at any time about working on this project, which will go on for the next two years. But another project is, is just starting with Dr. Peters, I'm sorry, Professor Peters on the robotic arm. And the question that we're pursuing here is can a robotic arm build a vegetative wall? It seems very feasible that you could actually start to build the wall, it could be interior, it could be exterior, and it could actually continue to feed and, and nutrient and hydrate those plants. Another, another project that you might be interested in is can a culinary living wall spontaneously inflate? Dr. Davis Sikora, we have several opportunities and, and uh, we're looking at growing plants and structure together. We always try to take you somewhere. Boston, Washington, San Francisco, New York. Your work is a part of ours and the students get out to present and try. Check us out.
and develop. Even though science is looking into nature for aspiration. So there's a, there's a struggle. Science from one side, you know, it cannot explain a painting, so it ignores it. Uh, somebody like uh, Emmanuel Kant, a philosopher, tried to resolve the apparent dichotomy by <coughs> equating aesthetic judgment to cognition of nature. It's recognition that it exists and it does something, it's mysterious, but that's it. Let's do something else. Um, so what is humanism anyway? It is defined as the rational philosophy informed by science, inspired by art, motivated by compassion. I'm trying in this talk to talk about infusing compassion in architectural science, the boring side. Sustainable design by its very nature is about people, but it is inspired by science, yeah, but a little bit by uh, by art, but it's not inspired by it's not derived by compassion. It's derived by our values and new values and uh, life cycle cost analysis. I'm going today to talk about, give you quickly, seven projects in which humans are the center of the universe. I went inside a kiva, an underground little hole in the ground in the southwest to feel how a thousand year old Pueblo Indian experienced that space. It was horrible. I could not breathe. So I went out and I talked to the curator. What's wrong? This is a hole in the ground. Uh, how can people live there? So he said, well, they used to have this hole on the side. It's called a ventilation shaft. So I talked to Professor uh, Robinson when I came here. And he said, yeah, I showed, he showed me a picture. Six months later, I figured the science of how this thing actually worked. And I presented it in a conference and everybody was like, this was a primitive architecture. It's a very sophisticated system. And then we use the tools to start understanding how it works. This is another thing. We have the, the knowledge, the science. The, we know how to design buildings and environments that are comfortable for us and good for us. But this is not the trick. The trick is to actually be creative and innovative about what looks like a boring <coughs> formula. If I, five minutes? So instead of taking this data, I put it in a calendar. I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> or another, I, I noticed uh, there is a, a, a winter festival in Cleveland, and I did not understand how people actually tolerate all this cold and stay for a very, very long time. So I did all the simulation and all the analysis and I realized that it's too cold for people to make to, to power it. And what did you discover? That our metabolic rate goes up. So now we can actually find a human metabolic rate in urban areas in cold climate and we can learn about how can we use outdoor spaces for our uh, design. This is a boring ASHRAE human, uh, classification of the climate in the US based on building, heating, and cooling. So instead of this, with some students of mine, we collected data from a thousand stations. Each one has 8,680 pieces of data. And instead of looking at buildings, we looked at the human body and how it thermophysiologically reacts to this. And this is the new climate classification. Messy. Mess it makes sense to be messy because it's human. It's climate, it's the outside. Another interesting thing is the composite climates that exist between the climate zones. And as we zoom in later with the research, we'll find out exactly what's going on. The advantage of something like this is not only I know what the climatic classification, but I know what the solutions for passive design, that I know the solutions for high performance buildings. Another thing, that I'm going to talk about quickly is in 1995, <laughs> 1995, <laughs> 
740 people died in the city of Chicago because of a heat wave. So instead of using the technology to design, to think about new buildings, I went back in time with my students and we started understanding what actually happened in those seven days. And we were able to recreate the conditions indoors and outdoors. And we translated the data into human stress and we realized that that's why people died. So now we are writing and trying to help guide, create guidelines to prevent people from dying in buildings or outdoors when the temperature is high. The Master of Science in Architectural <laughs> Biology and Design, I'm looking at her in fear, is uh, encouraging students to engage in research. All the, th the things that you've heard is actually things that you can do with the faculty. A student actually proved for the first time using actual data from schools that they line improves long-term performance. I have a student who found out the mechanical system helped the power germs and viruses. <laughs> Is that legal, right? <laughs> and she presented this, and now we are trying to change this building standards, the energy standards, to make it work to account for patient and nursing safety. Thank you very much.
fabrication code for the robot arm, uh, which is now located on the board floor of the building here. Each module is 3D printed using a poly polypropylene plastic. Um, I wanted to use plastic, um, or I wanted to use a translucent material really um, to create this translucent effect and glowing effect at night. The two materials that are possible are glass and plastic. Um, glass really is much harder, much harder to 3D print at this point, so plastic was the option. Even though it's not structurally optimized, I did bring these modules to the University of Akron to test um, the structural capabilities, just to see if this is possible and it's with all its own um, strength, and that's not real speed, that's just um, But also, we wanted to investigate um, the printing process. So we're using tools that we have here in the college, this is using a thermal imaging camera to understand how uh, the, the printing process performs while it's being printed. Um, to understand how the layers can adhere, because the problem with printing in plastic is that it cools and heats up uh, rather quickly, and if it doesn't cool properly or bond properly, then it basically delaminates and splits apart. So it's important to understand that. Uh, each module was unique, um, slightly unique, um, and so they had a number embedded into the design, so I knew exactly where they would go during the installation and assembly of the going on site. Um, so it's composed out of 94 unique modules. Uh, what's unique also is that they have uh, an interlocking system where it allows them to snap together during assembly, but also snap, uh, uh, easily disassemble when the is done after its use. It's intended to be a temporary structure that can be quickly assembled on site and then taken apart uh, and reinstalled so once. So the view from the bottom, you can see these interlocking joints coming together, and here's you time lapses showing you how the pavilion basically performs over, over the course of the day or charges and then releases that energy. Each of the, the modules is not connected, they're acting independently, so they each gather a different amount of energy um, based on how much sun they did during that course of the day. So the pavilion changes each day and it will basically play back uh, the amount of energy that it collects over the course of the day. And so each day you can go back and at night. Um, so these are just a series of kind of time lapse for me to really display this idea where each day it can be completely different. So essentially, it's a series of 94 mini robots that are um, calibrated to do one simple task, which is turn on a sensor, um, collect energy, and then release that energy at night. And in the end, it's basically a, a large autonomous uh, robot. If you want to argue that. Um, so it was installed in, in uh, downtown Cleveland along the lakefront at Ingenuity Fest two years ago. Um, and so it was installed for that event. And so that was kind of the first life of the project, and it was, it was used and it worked great, and I was able to document the project. Um, but because we're working with plastic, it offers this kind of new opportunity where you can basically recycle it, you can completely recycle it essentially. So, um, I found two local companies to collaborate with, one basically with a, a shredded plastic, and so I took the whole pavilion and had it completely shredded down to nothing, uh, pellets of plastic, which is a little depressing. <laughs> so um, what, I, what I did next was took it to another local company where they make filament for 3D printing, and they allowed me to kind of use their machine for a day and insert this 100% recycled material to remake filament so that I can actually reprint a completely new structure using this recycled material. So this is uh, one of the sample prints from last year where we're using completely um, recycled material. The idea is that we're gonna be using this uh, to print a whole new pavilion this year. And so if you're interested in uh, either this project or uh, several others that you can uh, assist with, with, with me and Reed potentially as well, um, you can get out an email me or just find me up on the third floor where the robot are. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, please join me in welcoming Dr. Brett Tibby. He will be speaking about the de development of regional uh, modern cities in 20th century Spanish architecture.
for the opportunity to talk about uh, my research also. Um, you may know me, many of you know that I really like to study Richard Neutra, and that's true, but I also really like to study the, uh, the architecture of 20th century Spain, and that's why I went to Spain to do a doctoral degree there. Um, so this, what, I, what you're looking at here is the result of two grants that I received for this summer. One was a non-tenure professional development and excellence grant from the provost, the other was the uh, summer teaching uh, development grant for a new elective on Spanish history for you all. Um, so, uh, what I'm doing with this grant is expanding my current research to look more in depth at Spain, not so much at Richard Neutra's influence there, which was what my doctoral dissertation was on. And um, I'm looking specifically at the topics <coughs> of what some, uh, some theoreticians, many in fact, call critical regionalism. I'm looking at it specifically in Spain, although uh, there are problems with the term critical regionalism. First of all, um, it, not just in Spain, but around the world. First of all, that Spaniards, and frankly most anybody else, does not want to be called a regionalist. Uh, we'd rather be called modernists, modern architects. Um, Luis Fernandez Galliano, who happens to be architect and editor of the journal that you all know as El Croquis, um, remembers that in 1985 at a conference in Seville, Spanish architects were insulted when they were called regionalists and for good reason. Um, and also, um, although he doesn't necessarily talk about, the, um, about Spain as a case study, Keith Eggener, who is one of the critical uh, regionalist uh, experts, uh, says that most regions, there is no single correct regional style. Therefore, a critical regionalism simply cannot exist. So, why am I studying it? Um, well, particularly because uh, most of the historians, particularly those historians that are not uh, from Spain, like myself, writing about Spain, uh, ignore critical facts about uh, Spanish culture and, uh, and the architecture of the 20th century produced there. Uh, first of all, in, in, for example, in Kenneth Frampton has, has studied and written uh, much. He's one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the preeminent, uh, preeminent theorists in critical regionalism. Um, he writes and makes important observations about Spain. Uh, the problem with what he does is that he focuses almost entirely on Catalonia, which is one region in Spain, and hardly represents the breadth of Spain. And also, when he does reference things beyond Catalonia, they are from 1960, 1970, 1980. And so he's just not looking at what, uh, what went on before that. Um, by the way, what you're looking at here is uh, one of my first forays into this, uh, uh, this topic of critical regionalism, which was published just a few years ago in Architectural History. Um, and that was the, I got the cover image on it. Uh, it was a fantastic uh, uh, opportunity. Here's um, a, an article by, uh, by Kenneth Frampton, who, which is entitled Homage to Iberia, that only talks about Spain. Doesn't even mention Portugal. Sorry, Margarita, who's not in the room. And another theorist, Terence Riley, uh, uh, almost completely misunderstands what Spanish architecture is in the 1940s by saying it was all top down dictated by Franco himself. When you study Franco, you realize he probably wasn't smart enough to be interested in architecture. So not nearly like, like Hitler or Mussolini. So the idea that he would have dictated um, a, uh, a style is really pretty ludicrous. I can unpack all of that later. In fact, take the elective. Uh, we will do that. Um, but uh, uh, none of them take into account what's, what actually is generating uh, the architecture of, uh, of 20th century Spain, which happens to be Spanish philosophy. Um, and also the, the social, uh, socio-political context of post-1898 Spain. What happened in 1898? Anybody know? Who defeated the Spaniards? We did. In the Spanish-American War, we took their last colonies. What was once the great Spanish Empire was now reduced to the Iberian Peninsula and a few little islands in the, in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. What le left them doing was, it asked, it, they were asking themselves for an entire uh, half century, who are we now that we are no longer the world power? 
And so uh, part of that came, uh, you see it in Spanish philosophy here, Miguel de Unamuno, who was born in 1898, um, writes this incredible book called En Torno al Pacificismo. If anybody speaks Spanish and can tell me what Pacificismo really means, please let me know. Um, <laughs> and then also the Teoría de Andalucía, uh, which was written uh, a few years later by José Ortega y Gasset. Um, these are the, lead, the thought leaders in Spain, and it's time to start connecting what we talk about in terms of Spanish architecture in, uh, with uh, what they are thinking philosophically. Um, so, over the summer, I had the opportunity to use these two grants to uh, dive further into archival research, and like Professor Rugari, I spent an entire month in Spain digging in archives. It was fantastic. Um, <laughs> uh, literally blowing the dust off of these documents. Um, I was focusing on, oh, let me back up a little bit, uh, a couple of uh, articles that have never been translated into English until now. Um, are, are critical for understanding Spanish architecture. This is in part why theorists like Kenneth Frampton and Terence Riley don't talk about them. They aren't translated into English. One of them, perhaps the most, uh, well, there's Le 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 Torres Balbas, 1918 article, Mientras Labra en los Cigarros, a string of, uh, of articles written in the late 1940s by several Spanish architects that soundly rejected both lifeless uh, functionalism and sentimentalist historicism. Uh, Miguel Fisac's 1952 book, uh, La Arquitectura Popular Española y su Valor Ante la Arquitectura del Futuro, What is Vernacular Matters for Future Architecture? And this one, Fernando Chueca's 1953 uh, Manifiesto de la Alhambra, where he is putting the Alhambra forth as the example for how we pursue modern architecture in Spain. Um, as well as Carlos Flores' 1961 magnum opus, The Arquitectura Española Contemporánea. All of those are only in Spanish until now. When you take the, uh, uh, when you take the elective, you get to read them in English. Uh, so, I spent, uh, I spent time in Spain looking at uh, archives. This happens to be a Spanish engineer, Eduardo Carroja. This image is for you from this room. Um, a, a sketch of his for an early house. Uh, Jose Luis Fernández de Ramo with his uh, um, agricultural villages scattered across the, um, the country, and uh, Jose Maria Sostres' own sketchbook um, in, in Barcelona, um, and visiting a couple of examples of modernista architecture. And by the way, Gaudí was not the only one that was rationalist and modernist at the same time. Thank you. Thanks again, everyone.